Psalms 37. Uh, David wrote Psalms 37 after he was reflecting back on a life of walking with God through what had become to David a very turbulent world. He wasn't following some creed from some preacher, some church. He was following the Lord. He wasn't following just some sermon. He needed a fresh touch from God every day. And the circumstances that God put him in when he was very young was times that he could learn to, to, to spend time just being quiet in the silence and solitude of being with God and let God be like one wave after the another just to refresh his spirit. He wasn't trying to live up to someone else's expectations. Matter of fact, David learned real early in life that he couldn't do that. But David sought after God because he wasn't a hypocritical Christian. He, was, he, he, he sought after God because he was God and he needed him. He needed his presence. He needed his power. He needed his fellowship. He needed his love. He needed his, his strength and leadership in life. And I hope that that's the reason why you got up this morning and got dressed and came to be in God's house. Or if you're watching online, there was something that made you just say, this is what I need. I need something fresh from God. David was not perfect, but he learned to trust in one who was. Psalms 37 was written against the backdrop of bad people. And what these bad people had sought to do against David and how there was a stirring in his spirit because of it. When we talked about that word fretting, that churning, that burning, a righteous indignation, something that he was going through that he just needed to be able to live above the chaos. Not just simply to be beaten down by it. So last week when we talked about what it meant to commit your way to the Lord, to roll those burdens over, the, over into the Lord. David learned that. He learned to give his dreams, his wants, his aspirations, that life path over to the Lord, the burdens, the obligations. He learned what it meant to give his family to the Lord. to give his finances to the Lord. And he also learned what it meant to give his freedom to the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I hope we hear this fresh from God. I told the church Wednesday night, I said, I'm preaching on something that I've failed miserably at in my life. I was sharing with Mark, I'm not speaking out of school, but I, I was telling Mark, I was reminding Mark of where I was headed this Sunday. I said, I'm preaching on rest, what it means to rest in the Lord. He looked at me and he said, and I, and I, I think I said to him, I said, I, I have failed miserably in that. And he said, uh, we both have. There's a lot of us that can talk a good talk. But we need to learn that we need to live the precepts and principles of God. And in this world in which we live, where things are happening so quickly, pressures are coming upon us from every different angle. Would you agree with me that it would be wise if we could learn what it means that God said, rest unto the Lord? If you have your Bible, stand with me in honor of reading God's words. I understand that in the New King James Version, it says in verse 1, do not fret. But I learned this in the Old King James, and I just like it when it says, fret not. Fret not because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord. That's what it's all about, folks. And if you do trust in the Lord, do good. 
It says, dwell in the land. Settle down. Feed on His faithfulness. Eat of that which God has prepared for you. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord. Brian's version says, and if you do, He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. And He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light. By the way, that's His righteousness that He put in you that becomes yours. Your righteousness. He will make it shine as the light and your justice as the noonday. Now hear this. Rest in Jehovah God, the God of covenant. That means God has provided this for you. Just as God has provided salvation for you in the same exact manner, God has designed and provided rest for us. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. They're always going to be there, folks. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Listen to verse 10 now. For yet a little while. I wish I knew how long a little while was sometimes. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, and it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth. That means God owns it, but God allows us to partake of it, and it becomes ours. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves, listen to this now, in the abundance. Can y'all say praise God for abundance? Of peace. The abundance. Does anybody need abundance of peace in your life, in your circumstances, in your situations? Does anybody need today to drink a little bit of the rest that comes, that was promised and provided from the Lord? Let's pray again. Now, Father, I ask afresh and anew that your Spirit would be upon us, Jesus, that you would be high and lifted up, that we would hear your words to our heart as you call us under rest. Speak personally, make it real, make it last. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. There is a commandment from God. It actually made the top 10 in Exodus chapter number 20. Verse number um, 8 says this, Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, separate in God, holy for Him, sanctified for God. It belongs to Him. Now, there is much that God does for us. Can you say amen? But there's something that He asks from us, and that's to spend time together. Rest unto the Lord is right there. He says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. God gave us the command to work. Right? We'll talk about more of that in just a second. But he said the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. Your God. This is His rest. This is His Sabbath unto Him. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servants, leave them alone, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. It is mine. If you can hear this from God, He says, it's mine, leave it alone, keep your hands off it, it is your benefit if you do. In Genesis chapter number 3, it speaks of the time when Eve was deceived by Satan. And she wanted something that didn't belong to her. And because of that, sin was realized into her life. 
And there are always consequences for sin. Please hear that. There are blessings that come to us in life, just as this one that we're studying today, that is the blessing of rest. But if we do not heed, if we do not follow, if we do not listen, if we do not participate in that, there are consequences that come to our lives. And for me, sometimes it's too late. I'm living in the consequences because I didn't hear the word, right? But it said, God said to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toll. You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Men, cheer up. It gets worse, right? There is no retirement program from this. I, I know this is one of these things in, in our society today. Everybody is looking towards retirement. Nobody wants to work one day longer than they have to, except Clinton back there. He, doesn't, he just keeps on going, right? And then he says, in toil you shall have eaten all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? You shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That is a command of God. Matter of fact, the Bible also says that if you're not willing to, to work, you don't eat. Now I know that in our society, we need to work. And you and I both know that in our society today, we have government that, it, that has a rightful, uh, what I call a landing net for all those in our society who cannot take care of themselves. But my goodness, how that's being taken out of context. There are disabled in our world that need someone's helpful hand. There are children that are orphans. There are things that are actually needed, and I'm grateful for that. I am. But we have taken that to another level where if somebody just doesn't want to work, then they really don't have to. I, I think it became very crazy this year Then there was an NBA player who just didn't want to work. And, and, and trust me, I understand when, when people say they have mental issues, but his mental issues, he had nothing wrong with him physically, and he was, he was offered all this stuff from the team to get his mental health right. He just didn't want to play, and, and he settled with the uh, – he didn't play one game. Not one game, and he settled with them. They, they finally traded him off, and, and, and he got $25 million for not playing one game. Is there anybody in here who would like to take a year off and, and, and be able to get $25 million for it? Where have we gone? What have we done? You know, we were created for work, and you'll never be happy unless you submit yourself under that. That's just the things of how God created us. But God also created rest. Rest unto the Lord. I had a friend who knew the Word of God real well, and he uh, wanted to argue with it, this with me. And he says, the Bible says we're supposed to have rest. I said, well, you got half of it. We're supposed to have rest unto the Lord. So many people won't rest, but they won't rest their way. They want it on their schedule. Matter of fact, God's already given us a schedule. Y'all good with that? But we cannot, we don't have to rest just one day. We can actually rest seven days if we abide with God. That's not the sermon for the day. That's John 15. But there's great strength and power and wisdom in those words, what it means just to abide with Him, to be there. David says it like this, just trust in the Lord. There is a time of refreshment. I'll tell you there's a time of refreshment that comes through worship. And I think that one of the things that we found out after this COVID season where people were told not to work, where people were told they couldn't come together and worship, we, were to we went through all of these things and, and people took time away from church. And now we are seeing that, in, not just in New Holland, yes, in New Holland, 
But just about everywhere, just about almost every pastor that I've talked to, there is a group of people who never came back to church. And, and, and really, we have not seen the full consequences of that yet because what has happened is they have removed worship from their life and they've, su they've supplemented it for something else that they thought would be more important to them. And the, the other shoe will fall and they'll run back and they'll say, oh, no, no, I didn't really mean this. I, I, I wasn't expecting this. Well, that's why we have the Word of God that we're supposed to follow. When it's sunshine, amen. When it's raining, amen. When, when your paths are wonderful and smooth, amen. If you're going through a storm, amen. The Word of God always fits. The word rest, you may be interested to know, is a verb. It is an action that you do. But it means to stop. Now, you chew on that for a moment. Think about that. It means to be quiet. It means to be silent. It means to be still. It means to tarry. It means to be astonished. There are so many people, myself included, that have been so busy that we have, we, have, we have missed the wonder and the astonishment of stopping being still, being quiet before God, listening and looking and watching and hearing and being blessed by the splendor of everything that God's placed around us. So busy, so moving, that we never rest. Physical weariness can bring toll and hardship to your life that Jesus said needs rest. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 6, in verse 31, when the disciples were ministering with him, and they were just going day after day and the multitudes were there. Jesus said in Mark 6, 31, come aside by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while. Come. Come aside. By the way, by yourself. To a deserted place and rest a while. Sometimes we need to put down the labors as God told us to and be still and just have physical rest. But there's also mental and emotional weariness that needs a different kind of rest. It, people just say, oh, I just need a vacation. So they go to the beach and they get to the beach and they never rest. How many of y'all have ever went on vacation and you needed a vacation from your vacation? Right? I'm not saying that those things are not important but there's something else that may be there that we need to hear and heed as a matter of fact jesus said this so wonderfully well in matthew chapter 11 he said to them by the, by the way a very difficult time that they were going through this was after they had heard that john the baptist had been beheaded for being faithful to god Jesus went away to, to have some quiet time. The multitudes came there, and he ended up ministering when he should have been resting. But it, to them, he said, Come unto me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. The word labor there means to work to the place of exhaustion. It literally means that you are doing so much physical toll that you don't know if you can take another step. Have y'all ever been there? Come to me, all you of you, all of you who labor, but are heavy laden, who are burdened down. How many of you have so many burdens from from friends and from family and from finance and from this person and that person, and this situation and that situation, and you're just so weighted down. And it's like you might be standing still, but your heart's revving up about 8,000 RPMs. And you go to sleep and you just say, if I could just rest, 
but you lay in it and you do the, the somersaults. Roll to the left, roll to the right. Right? You flip the pillow 22 times. I mean, just trying to do find any little place. If I could just get a little rest, or, or you'll go to sleep, and, and, and two hours later you'll wake up, and you'll say, I'm not done. Because all of those things are just going crazy. Jesus said, come unto me. May the Holy Spirit right now, as only He can, can He speak to hearts. Because this needs to be personal. I want you to hear God, the perfection of His will and His way. As He is saying to you, and you know your circumstances, He is saying to you, would you come? Would you come? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, say it with me, church. Yes. Say it again. Yes. I will give you. Who's it come from? Christ. Did he promise? Come on, did he promise? Does he lie? Is he incapable of doing it? He can. He can do this for you. I will give you what you need and what you, sometimes we don't even realize that this is what we need. I will give you rest. So take. God is offering something. Are you willing to say, yes, Lord? will take my yoke upon you. Oh no, that, 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 that doesn't sound too good. I, what, I, what I'm looking for, Lord, is I, I'm looking for 20 angels to come down and minister to me. I mean, after Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness and at the, tire, at the end of it, when he was tired and weary, did he not have angels that came and ministered to him? Man, or is that what you're looking for? 20 angels to come down and put you on soft pillows and have fans and they will feed you and, and they'll touch you and give you rest into your soul. Jesus said, take my yoke. Now, everyone in that day, and you probably too, you know that the yoke was the thing that they put on the oxen because there was a job that they needed to do and those oxen were going to pull the weight of that burden. But here it is, he says, take my yoke. This is not a single yoke, this is a double yoke. That means when we get yoked up, we get yoked up with Christ. And how many of you know that what one oxen can do is amazing, but put two together and exponentially, the, the, the increased power is amazing that they can do more together than they could by themselves. And there's so much of how we are handling the circumstances of life where control freaks that we are, we're trying to handle it. And he is saying, come yoke up with me. There is a way that I have that the strength that you will receive to do the work that you will do will be so much more beyond what you could ever imagine. Come unto me, Take my yoke and learn from me. Does anybody in here need to learn what it means to rest? How to rest? If I said these words to you, they'll probably be just as far into you as they are to me. And by the way, I said them in January of this year. Silence and solitude. Oh, you may have Remember that part of the message? I remember those words the preacher said. Yeah, he, he told us that we were to have silence and solitude. How many of y'all did that? Well, maybe. How many of you did it enough? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am meek, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. You, your labor may be so much labor that you're at the point of exhaustion, but he says, my yoke is easy. The burden that you're carrying that he's talking about there in verse 28, all of you are, who labored are heavy laden, you're burdened down with it, but he says, my burden is, what's the word? 
Say it again. Light. I've given you this picture before, but I think it's amazing. There'll be a weightlifter. Let's say he's on a bench press, and he's benching all that weight, and that last one he can barely get up, and somebody will do what they call spotting them, and they'll go up there with one finger, one finger on that bar, and where you can't push it any further, one finger just goes straight right back up. How many of y'all have experienced that? How many of y'all have seen that? I'll raise both hands. I've done it. I'm amazed by it. I want to look at him and say, I was giving it everything I could and I couldn't get it up one more time and you just gave one finger. And they're like, well, we're together though. I wish we could get that mental image in our soul that if we, as we strain under the burden of, of, of trying to fix everything and everybody and wanting our way and, and we got to toil and we got to strive and we got to work and we've got all these expectations, if we could just slow down and be quiet before the Lord and listen to Him, He may add one finger that can do so much more. So much more. It's the approach... Acts 16. <laughs> I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you. I know that. But uh, y'all going to like this. Kale's great. He can keep up with me up here. Acts 16, verse 22. Paul and his compadre Silas are preaching at Philippi. How many of y'all have ever read the book to the Philippians? God did an amazing work there. It didn't start that way. It didn't start that way. This is how it started. Verse 22, Then the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Anybody want to volunteer for that? Anybody want to be caned? And when they had laid many stripes on them, I wonder if that hurt. Beaten, bruised, weary, bleeding. They threw them into prison, commanded the jailer to keep them securely, and having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Well, that's exactly what you need. Get down there, can't move, can't adjust, probably leaning on some wall there where you've been beaten with all those rods and it just hurts and you don't even want to put any, you don't want, don't touch me, all that kind of stuff, but they have no place. Wouldn't that be the wonderful place for a pity party? Could we not cry out and yell and complain, Lord, was I not doing your bidding? As a matter of fact, Lord, I was going in a different place. I was going to go down to Asia Minor, but you stopped me and you sent me to this place. This is what you wanted? Hold on. I guess you can't abide with the Lord because it says at midnight, midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. And singing hymns to God. I've wondered if Psalms 37 was one of the hymns they were singing. Trust in the Lord. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. I wonder if he is saying, they were, they were singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. All blessings. Maybe they remembered in their spirit that what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Maybe their perception was wrong. And maybe they realized that even in a jail cell, hurting and beaten was a wonderful time to worship and rest unto the Lord, to be recharged and rejuvenated, to be strengthened, to be focused. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing because it blesses us and it blesses everyone else. But because they did, the Word of God says this, while they were praying and singing hymns to God, the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. Isn't it amazing how God can find you right where you are and give you right where you need, but it's always for the glory of God? God put them there for the glory. God used them there for the glory. Now he's going to manifest the glory before them. The keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open. Suppose the prisoners had fled. He drew his sword, was about to kill himself because he knew if they escaped, 
that he would be killed. So he's willing to do it quickly and kill himself. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. They probably were thinking, if I could just get out of jail, it would be great. But when they had the opportunity, they said, no, 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 we're here. We're here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said to them, Sirs, I love that politeness. What must I do to be saved? Now, I know that's a religious term. And if I say to somebody, you need to be saved, you, most of y'all who know the religious terms are saying, that person needs salvation. But the word means to be taken out of, out of a hardship, to be saved out of turmoil. Correct? And that's what he said. Look, I put you in a place of hardship, but I realize in my spirit, I'm the one that needs to be saved out of hardship. You're here beaten and hurting, but you've got rest. You've got peace. There's something about you that just exudes love. Do y'all need that? In the worst of the day, in the worst of circumstances, in this awful world where you're hated, and by the way, it's going to get worse. Today, the freedom is here that anyone could come here that wants to. Don't believe that that freedom is going to stay with us. They told us before we weren't supposed to come to church. They may tell you that you don't have the right to come to church. They may tell you that your church can only be done in a certain way. It's happened in history. Don't tell me it won't happen again. Don't tell me it won't happen here. Even if it does, you can still rest unto the Lord. Jesus said in John 14, 27, He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I could preach for 25, 30 more minutes. Can I just sum it up? There's a story that we all know that I've shared and I've preached and I will preach again. Jesus put the disciples in a boat, sent them out in the midst of a storm that was coming. And by the way, while he was there, they were there, he was praying for them. They didn't know if they were going to make it. But Jesus came to them when they couldn't come to Jesus. He didn't go jump in the boat. He just stood out there. And I believe this. He smiled at them. Not a, nah, 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 not that kind of smile. A love. And one of them, old Pete, saw his circumstance and saw Jesus' circumstance and said this. By the way, this made no sense outside of Jesus. <laughs> Lord, can I come out there with you? Would you give me permission to come out there and be with you? That does not make sense. He wasn't talking about swimming. You're standing out there in peace, smiling in love. I'd rather be out there with you than in this boat. But he was going to have to yoke up with Jesus. He was going to have to trust in the Lord. He was going to have to get beyond all of the things that made sense in his mind. And he's living in turmoil. But he says, I want to do whatever I have to do to get out there and be in peace with you. And he threw one leg up over that boat, threw the other leg over that boat, and he walked out a miracle. By the way, how many of you would like to have a miracle today? Come on, let's just be honest. How many of you need a miracle today? We're one miracle away of something amazing happening, right? Is he the same God? Could you say, Lord, bid me come to you? I guarantee you what Jesus would say, come on. But you're going to have to leave all that, but you're going to have to trust in me and leave all that behind. 
And because old Pete was willing to do that, he walked on water. And by the way, he stopped and paused and started to say, this is impossible. For a moment, he quit trusting in God. And what happened? Circumstances took over. But he cried out. And the Lord met him there, grabbed him up. I love this. Helped him up. And Jesus is standing there with a big smile on his face. And I believe old Pete was doing this. Hey guys, me and the Lord, my best friend over here. How y'all like that boat now? Come on. Come unto me. All you that are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you, say it with me, God's will, God's way, for God's glory, for our benefit.